so within the United Methodist Church, there have been many churches that have been allowed to disaffiliate. In fact, thousands of them have, but um, there are also many that haven't been allowed to disaffiliate, and there are many communities that have been estranged from their buildings, their assets have been put in the position of starting over afresh and leaving everything they had behind. And um, there are a lot of these churches, actually, that have had to uh, leave everything behind and, and start on a new thing. And then there have been pastors as well that have had to, to minister to these communities and, and help them continue to have faith in the Lord and, and be faithful in the midst of a, a circumstance that is very insulting to many, very discouraging to many. Dan Ladd is one of these uh, people that has been supporting these churches, and he's actually—let uh, me read to you about Dan Ladd. He— is um, the interim pastor of Rock and Refuge Church in Westminster, Maryland. He was ordained by the Southern Baptist Convention in February of 2004, and he's been part of several church plants over the last 20 years of ministry. He's been the leader of the New Exodus Bible Study since 2006, which focuses on exploring the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. He also leads a weekly youth Bible study called the Holy Donut Club, which helps teenagers learn to study and live out God's Word. Dan is a full-time salesman for a company called uh, Milby Company and does all his ministry work as a volunteer. He lives with his wife Amy and their two sons Nathan and Noah in Hampstead, Maryland. So at this point I'm going to uh, direct you to pay attention to him and learn from him and his circumstances at this time. Um, Dan, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you, brother? Doing well. Thank you for having me on, Jeffrey. Well, I knew it needed to happen. I want to say thanks to Reverend Matt Sickle, who connected us. He, of course, uh, seems to think highly of you, and I'm sure um, you, you really have been an exemplar of Christian virtue in your context, the, the leadership that your congregation needed. And, and it was my hope in contacting you that you would be able to faithfully minister to these congregations around uh, not just the United States, but around the world who are thinking of starting afresh in order to— um, be free of uh, what have felt to be shackles of the United Methodist Church. So thank you for joining me to, to help me do that, because I haven't been through that. I was one of the, the blessed ones that got to transfer over. I'm one of these blessed ones that uh, I this is my full-time job and my full-time income. You really are in a very different location than me, and, and I need to learn from people like you as well. So let's let's just start off with what you think. If, if you were a person in a local church that um, was thinking about going out in this way. You have a hostile United Methodist Annual Conference. They are not going to facilitate this affiliation. Um, what do you think right now at the very beginning of this conversation you would want to hear? Hmm. Good question. So if I'm in that situation, I want to know that there is there is a way to continue to do church in a God-honoring way. And if I feel like I'm in a church where that's not happening, I'd want to know that there is a way to continue to do that and continue to do it under a Methodist kind of umbrella as well, instead of having to go out and do something completely different. So, um, and I'd want to know that there might be options for me in the area that I could attend. And I'd also want to know if there wasn't an option in the area that there was a possibility of starting something afresh to kind of fill a void in a certain area. And that's kind of more what our story is, is that, that latter thing. Yeah, go ahead and tell us your story. I'm very interested in the play-by-play, -play. and of course, you know, it's possible to get real mucked down in the minutia, but um, are, would you be able, over the course of five, ten minutes, uh, give us kind of a picture of what your congregation's been through? Certainly. So, um, so uh, I, I found out about this entire situation from my good friend, Reverend Matt Sickle, who introduced the two of us, but uh, there was a church in the um, in the North Carroll area here in Maryland that was a UMC church, and when time when I guess it was last year they had a vote for disaffiliation, and the vote failed. It was literally fifty fifty split for the church. So mm. the church stayed in the UMC, um, but a large portion of the congregation decided they didn't want their money going to the UMC anymore. So a few people found other local GMC churches, but. The thing is, in our area, the closest GMC churches are either 30 minutes north or 30 minutes south. So there's kind of this hole in the middle. And a, a group of people from this church that had voted to disaffiliate, they got together in someone's living room one day and they said, can we start something ourselves and so we can still continue to meet together? Um, so they stepped out in faith and decided in the uh, summer of last year 
that they were going to try to meet together and see if they could get something started. And you know as well as I do, if you want to start something in the church calendar, like June is not a great month to start it. But that's when the timing kind of worked out. So they decided to start it then. Um, and then Matt is in that Bible study you mentioned that I do the New Exodus Bible study. So he was having us pray for this group. He called them the Wesley refugees, the ones that had left the church and didn't really have another place. Um, and so my wife and I, like our heart was really stirred for their plight because we felt like they had stood up for truth and they had lost their church over it. So we had uh, prayed about it and talked. And then I, I reached out to Matt and I said, do you think they want someone to come in that has some church planning experience and pastoral experience to help them get up and running and get off the ground? Uh, so he arranged up for a meeting with me and the leadership team there. And, um, and we got to meet together and they were um, overwhelmingly in favor of us kind of joining together. Mm. And it was, it was incredible because we're, we're talking during the meeting and they they tell me, they say, um, so we've got this church that we're using and they're letting us use their building for free. And, and I stopped and I'm like, wait, what? you got a building for free like that one of the biggest challenges in church planning is finding a building to use begin with let alone how much is going to cost you like no no this church is letting us use our building for free we just have to use it during off hours and so they're talking more and they're talking about like you know we can use the microphones the soundboard and then i stopped them again and i'm like wait they let you touch their stuff like <laughs> if you go into someone else's church and they allow you to use their building like no one ever lets you touch their stuff especially the sound equipment um, and it was just things like that, like over and over where it's like you could see God starting to provide already. Hmm. Uh, so I offered to come in for a period, probably like I figured it takes between 18 to 24 months to get something from the ground up, up and running and kind of do that um, free. Like my my um, my calling for 20 years now has been to use my pastoral gifts as a volunteer and still work as a different job to support my family. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a perfect match for this group that needed help, but didn't have um, the funds right away to, to have a pastor. So, um, so we, we started meeting and it's kind of gone from there. We, we got through the summer and then by the time we got through the summer, we're like, okay, I think we can really call this a church now. Like when I started going, it was kind of a few people in the room. Someone would sit up there and like read a chapter of scripture and talk about it a little bit. So when I got there, we kind of changed to a method of, OK, like we're going to we're going to preach. We're going to have like a full order of service, uh, put together a team of a couple of other people in that group that also had some some teaching desire and giftings. Um, and we've been able to to do services um, in October. We actually fully set up the legal entity, Rock and Refuge Church. Um, we set it up as a non-denominational church to begin with, with kind of what I call, like, call a Methodist flavor. Every non-denominational church has some kind of a flavor, so we still operate mm -hmm. similar to a Methodist church. Uh, and the idea is to continue to build and get to a point where we're fully launched uh, and eventually uh, come to a point where we decide whether or not we want to join the GMC or whether the church wants to stay independent. Um, when I came on board, like my full expectation was I was going to help get this up and running, hand the church off to the GMC. The GMC would appoint a pastor to the church. Uh, shortly after I came, I realized that there wasn't full consensus on whether to join another denomination or whether to stay independent. So that's part of what we're going to be looking a little bit down the road this year to be praying about and seeking God's will for. Yeah, that's that's something that is before a lot of churches that have either left or are thinking about leaving. It's not at all clear if they're going to be joining the Global Methodist Church or the. I just recently interviewed John Ed Matheson, whose church joined the Free Methodist Church. There are a lot of options, and then of course staying independent is an option. And I would point everybody to my interview with Matt Judkins, who's, who took his church independent. We had a very good dialogue around that. And, of course, there are going to be challenges for your particular flock as well, because you yourself are not uh, a, a Wesleyan. You are a Baptist, a Southern Baptist. So can you talk about some of the doctrinal differences there and, and where it is that you've had to exercise some grace and your, your local flock has had to exercise some grace in the midst of those differences? Certainly, yes. Fortunately, being that this is the people that were thinking about joining the GMC to begin with, mm -hmm. that they're already the we already have a lot of theologically conservative um, values that are shared. The biggest things have to do more with like how a Sunday morning runs. Um, so, whereas in Methodist infants are baptized in the Baptist church as believers baptism by right. immersion, uh, and the other biggest difference would be in the in the Southern Baptist Church, women aren't ordained. Women don't serve in leadership roles within the church. Women don't typically preach. Uh, so when I when I set out to help this church, I fully understood that 
I wasn't going here to make a bunch of Methodist Baptists. I was going here to help a group of Methodists get a church up and running. And so seeing that these are areas that are um, not essential to salvation, I've offered grace and I'm operating the way a Methodist pastor would in that. So um, our, we have four people on the teaching team. Two of them are women, two of us are men. We have four people on the leadership team, two women, two men. We're looking to add a, a third woman to the team as well. Uh, so basically in those areas where we've had difference and as far as baptism goes, we haven't had the opportunity to yet, but I've told the, the leadership team that if you want to baptize an infant, then we can have Reverend Matt Sickle come and do that. If we want to do a believer's baptism, then I'll do that. So trying to make accommodations there as well. That's gracious. That's wonderful. Um, okay, so let's talk dollars and cents and logistics and specifics, because that's the kind of brain I have. If I were a person in a local congregation wanting to think about this, I would instantly want to say, well, this congregation had everything handed to them, okay? They, they got a pastor for free. They got a building for free. They get to mess with the stuff for free. How realistic is it to expect that any other fellowships that go out on uh, faith like this are going to, uh, to, to be handed all this free stuff? So um, perhaps let's just start with what was the size of the fellowship coming out uh, to begin with last year? So when I started, it was probably like— 12 to 16 people on a given week um, when it when it just started out. Now we're doing, we usually run between high teens to mid twenties for a particular service on any given week. And we've had a couple high water marks for special events that are you know, well above that. But basically we've got a core group of a uh, little more than a dozen families that have started this out. And how many, how, uh, what was the attendance of the worship service at the previous church they came out of? What was the total? Did, was it about half that came out or a third or how, how is it shaken out? I don't know. It, like best I can understand, I think about a third ended up leaving, uh, but I don't know because I wasn't super involved with, mm -hmm. with the church they came out of. So I don't know what their weekly attendance was. Okay. So some people might hear high teens, low twenties, man, if that's all we're going to get away with, then a, a lot of people don't even want to be par part of a church that small, but maybe what the takeaway would be, it's going to be a fraction of the size of wherever you started off. So if it's between a third and a half of where they started off, that can be really uh, worthy. And I would just push back on people that if, if in order for it to be worthy, it has to be a certain size, then you might have some undergirding theological presuppositions that need to be questioned there. Um, so uh, we have the size of the fellowship. Um, is is the budget up and running? Are people giving generously, or at this point, are you just really lucky to have a bunch of free stuff? No, um, people have been very generous. So for the for the first five months, we had no bank account, and we literally had zero expenses. I mean, other than like people running copies for bulletins, you know, that kind of thing. But um, people, what we did in the beginning was we would give. One week we would give toward anything that put in the basket went toward the church that was allowing us to use their building. Every other week we were putting money in a, a seminary fund for a person that was um, preparing to do their doctoral work for seminary. Um, but once we started, got our bank account going, we found that like we have a group of regular tithing givers that they give generously on a weekly basis. Um, we're still operating with very little expense because I, I still don't have to pay. F it, we're, we are giving some for the building now. I should clarify that. Like we, we took donations in the beginning, but now we give a regular monthly amount, even though it's not required of us, because we feel like it's we're in a financial position to do so, and we should be doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than other than that, and a couple other things, we don't have a whole lot of expenses. So month over month, we're building a surplus in our bank account rather than draining out a bank account. That's wise. And then what I assume would be the long term vision is hiring a dedicated full time pastor who would then be able to focus on continuing to grow the church in depth and size. Is, is that within the view right now or are people just happy to be where they are and not thinking too much about the future? No, that's definitely something that's in our planning for for this year to, to work toward is eventually having a staff pastor for the church. Um, whether it be we go GMC and the GMC assigns someone or whether it be we remain independent and then it's a decision of whether I come on board or whether we look for somebody else. Um, so we're, we're still figuring that part out, but it definitely, the idea is definitely that we're looking toward bringing someone on board. Um, with the current finances, it would be a part-time person. Um, mm -hmm. Who's to know what will happen as we continue to grow and and see what God is leading and doing? Yeah, that's exciting. Um, okay, so let's talk about more practical stuff. 
if a local congregation is thinking about going this way, it's very intimidating to think about doing so without a property and without a leader. So um, let's talk about the leader first. How, how would a group of lay people that are thinking about going out on their own? I mean, it'd be wonderful if they could have their clergy go with them, but mm -hmm. you know that's probably not going to happen in most cases. So how would they wisely go about fishing around for someone to lead them once they've departed? Uh, well, I'll give you my best opinion, but in this case, they didn't. In this case, like God put the two of us together. You right, know, the right. Yours is an itself. exceptional case for sure. Yeah. Right. So um, like in, in the case before I came on board, basically there were certain people among that group that kind of had risen up as leaders within the group and they were just taking turns teaching and just trying to figure out what was going to happen. Um, as far as like what pastoral networks to look at, like I can't give you a whole lot of advice there. All I can say is that it, in our story, like God showed these people stepped out in faithfulness and he was willing to provide like way more than they ever expected they were going to get. Yeah, what what they've gotten is beyond what's reasonable to expect, in my opinion. But that's, uh, you know, we don't have a reasonable God in that sense. He's He often does bless us far beyond what we deserve or have even worked for. I've had a number of people, I do a weekly live stream on Fridays, and I've had a number of people... Um, talk to me privately on there or, or publicly on there or privately through email just saying this is really a, a hard place for our congregation right now we have no idea who we could lean on we have no leadership that we can depend on and for the time being my answer has been look clergy are great but clergy don't constitute the church the church is con constituted of the priesthood of all believers and if you don't have a pastor that that does not absolve you of your obligation to to be a part of a body of Christ seeking purity. So you need to raise up capable lay leadership that is is willing to serve even if they don't know what they're doing, even if they're not confident. Um, it's better to lack clergy than to lack a faithful church. Um, and you're nodding your head, so that tells me that yes. you're not entirely unsympathetic with, with that viewpoint. Um, do you think there's any caution that I need to offer people beyond saying that? I don't think so at this point. Like I said, in, in ours, like these people set out basically with that in mind. And I think their their thought was that, hey, if we can make it through the summer, maybe this really is a church. And so um, they fully set out to go through the summer doing it in a somewhat Bible study kind of format in a church building with people that hadn't spent a whole lot of time teaching, but had a, had a desire to see this thing grow. Uh, and I like our story just really solidifies that if it's the right thing to do, God will provide for things that you don't even imagine. Yeah. Well, so God providing, and, and, and the first practical concern was finding a pastor. And so, yeah, even if you're all lay people at first, continue having conversations, continue reaching out and looking for what resources are available, and odds are there are whether or not it's a pastor like you that's willing to donate all of your time and energy for God's glory, mm -hmm. or someone who's retired, who's capable and willing to do it part-time, or someone who's in seminary and needs to intern. You know, there are all kinds of options to think and pray about. Right. Thinking about the building now, how— so in my mind, I would think that that's actually more feasible to put together. Churches in general are shrinking— um, uh, many are trying to, to, to get the bills paid. It seems reasonable to me to reach out to other already instituted churches and say, hey, uh, would you like to, to host us and we can kick in some money? Uh, we can have a cooperative here. How, how difficult do you think that that is generally to put together? What are some best tips in establishing those relationships that you would offer? Well, and once again, depending on your size, when you get started, like most church plant to plants start in somebody's living room. So, I mean, if you've got somebody that's got a, a decent sized house and you want to start out there, that's it's a place you can always start. But I would think as well that with with the amount of churches in the area, that there are very likely some church that would be willing to to let you use their space as long as you're doing it during off hours. So we've mm -hmm. like what we do is we meet on Saturdays from four to five and that's worked really well for our congregation. But I would think that between churches, um, we've also found like, like so say Easter Sunday morning, we wanna do a Sunday morning service on Easter. We don't have access to this building Sunday morning. I reached out to a local fire hall and I reached out to the American Legion building. The local fire hall was very expensive. 
the American Legion building said we could use the building for whatever donation we felt we could do. So, you know, that was only one of three places we called and God already showed us, okay, you want to do it here? You can do it for whatever kind of money you can afford to do. So I would think those kinds of things too, fire halls, Elks Lodges, you know, different types of um, community facilities are a good place to reach out and seek and see if you can use the facilities. Yeah, I've heard of um, church plants using um, public school buildings as well. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, there there are certain places that are not open on the weekends, but they could use the extra income or they're happy just to participate in civic virtue. So what I'm hearing, though, in, in putting all this together, laity have to transition from being consumers to being active participants in the life of of the church. Uh, Unfortunately, the United Methodist Church, I'm going to make a broad statement. You don't need to agree with me. But it's my understanding, and I've seen it, that the United Methodist Church trains people to be passive consumers and recipients of whatever they offer rather than where Methodists started off, which was a very strong lay-led movement that was very active in, in forming these churches. To be active... Well, and and here I do want some feedback. It seems to me that American society has grown much less entrepreneurial in general in creating their own destiny. I've worked with a lot of people that need to just go out and get a job or get accredited uh, to do something and getting people just to make a phone call, just to get out and beat the pavement and make some new friends and make some new connections. It seems to me that whatever that muscle that is, has generally atrophied among a lot of people and just learning how to ask questions and conduct an investigation and try and build relationships that all of this is stuff that people are generally weak in that in order to plant a new church you need to be strong in so speak to that a little bit yeah i mean trust me church planning is not easy um i and i am not entrepreneurial by nature so like i'm not a natural church planter but god keeps having me involved in these things so i just keep doing what he tells me to do um when i started with this group i actually told them i said um when i my first church plant i was ever a part of they told us one out of every five church plants make it and i told them i said i'm oh for three so i have a one in two chance of this one actually working <laughs> so um it, just a little bit of humor with them but in, in reality like church planting is hard work um it, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of effort but i found that when when it's what god is calling you to do then it, it can be incredibly rewarding as well but, but it it does take more effort than just going to your existing church and your existing building that you've been in and your parents were in and your grandparents were in you know a lot of my adult life i've spent in churches that met in schools and cafeterias and places like that rather than in their own building so for me the lack of a building was never as big of a thing as i know it can be for some people um, but it's still worthwhile. And with this particular endeavor, when I looked at it, I saw, well, this is meeting an immediate need. And so maybe that's part of what a congregation looks at too, because if there had been a GMC church within like a 15 minute ride from where these people were going, I think most of them would have just gone there. Mm -hmm. The reason we looked to start something new was because there was a void in the area of a, of a conservative theological Methodist church. And so we saw that there was, there was a need and there was a possibility to start something up and provide something in the area that wasn't already existing. And that, that's one of the biggest things with church planting is, are you just trying to be one of like five other things in the same area, or are you offering something that is unique and different that is not in the area currently? Yeah. Yeah, there, there is a certain, um, oh, I don't know, market concern conversation that people would be wise to ask. You know, there's no point setting up something new or reinventing the wheel if if that itch is already getting scratched. Something else while you're talking that I'm, I'm, I'm realizing is a social issue is fear of failure. So I was just talking about la- lack of entrepreneurial spirit or lack of initiative, lack of self-starters. But also, um, especially a, a, among younger generations, we're finding a greater sensitivity to failure and fear of failure, such that, um, the, for instance, the example I'm thinking of, there are a lot of young men men my age and younger who have given up on dating altogether. They would love to be married and have kids, but they're so afraid of rejection and dealing with um, Mm -hmm. um, um, opposition that they just don't even try anymore. And I think there are a lot of people who would love to do a new church plant if they were 100% sure that it would work out. But as soon as there's an introduction of a possibility that it might not work out. As soon as they're talking about working with a pastor who's had uh, a, a success rate of 0 to 3, 
then they're going, no, 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 count me out. I don't want to waste money on that. I don't want to waste time on that. That would just be discouraging. And I think that that also betrays a real anemic theology of the church or of how our relationship with God works. I think there's a very worldly way of thinking, which is I have to build something that lasts forever in a worldly sense. I have to build an edifice. Mm -hmm. I have to to do something that lasts till my grandkids are here. And I'm just not sure that that matters to the Lord. I think the Lord is much more concerned with, are you answering faithfully right now, even if it it could get wiped out or depleted or fall apart in some time? I, I think God is much more pleased with that than with people who are not going to invest unless they know for sure it's going to work out. What do you think about all that? You know, totally, because I can tell you that from from every failure I've had in my church ministry time, like I've learned from it, I've grown from it. God has used it to help me grow. And that fear of failure that like I've got two teenage boys and that's something I try to instill in them too, is like, I don't want them to grow up being the kind of people that aren't going to take risk because they're afraid it's going to fail. And my thing is, if you're in a church where you're not getting solid doctrine taught to you, where you're getting things that are contrary to solid doctrine talk to you, then that's that's most likely not where God wants you. I mean, may, may, maybe you're supposed to be someone that goes in and like speaks out against it. But for, for a lot of us, like that's not where we're supposed to be week in and week out. We're supposed to be somewhere where we can get taught uh, the Bible and the things that God wants us to learn and know. And if you're in a place where you can't get that through your church, then there's got to be somewhere else that God wants you, whether it's another congregation in the area or whether it's starting something up from scratch. Yeah, and man, I could imagine being in one of these congregations and hearing you going, I don't know, man, I that sounds way too, that sounds like a lot of work, that sounds like a lot of drama and a lot of uncertainty, and I need my church to be something solid for me, that's a place of comfort, um, I, I just don't, I you know, I, I hear you talking about the importance of solid doctrine, but let me tell you about my emotional needs, and they are to have a place that is solid for me, that I can go and get my cup filled up. Is there anything to be said to a person like that who is caught between this desire for creature comforts and this desire for biblical faithfulness? Really, it's it's something to really reach out and pray about and ask God, because all of us are in different situations in our lives, but seeking God's direction for what's going on in your life and what is God calling you to do and where where is he directing you? And I mean, I can tell you, even with our church, you know, with, with a little more than a dozen families, some of us are very involved in getting this up and running and have a lot of extra time we're putting in. Some people don't have near as much of a, a need to do that right now. Some, some people are more in the position where they're getting ministered to, and others are more in the position where they are ministering. Actually, one of the biggest challenges we had early on was we found that so much of what was being done was being done by a group of just a few of us. And come to find out like I'm I'm meeting all these people and getting to know them and I'm realizing I got a church full of people that were the involved people where they were before so we needed to actually within the last couple of months we started creating new opportunities for people to get involved because I had people that were tired of just coming and they wanted things to do as well and so we created opportunities for them because they, they had that need so if you're in a position where we're like you've got significant physical limitations you've got significant physical needs and you know wherever you're going to be at church like you're going to be receiving more than you're going to be giving like that's okay and it's not a reason not to step out because we have people in that position where we are and god is still using what we're doing each week to minister to them yeah it's so many people's faith they weren't even planning on this they were planning on going all their life comfortably within the united methodist church and not really having to worry about anything this dramatic. They might see this drama in other churches and go, oh, well, that's those crazy Baptists, you know, or uh, who, whatever, but the, they're seeing it now within their own tribe, and there's just kind of this deer-in-the-headlights response that I see from a lot of people just going, "That surely that can't be the case. You know, that that was my church here in Nowata. Our board chair has said in several different settings, whenever you first started talking about this stuff, Jeffrey, I didn't believe you. I thought you had to be wrong about how bad it's gotten but then I did my own research, and um, you know that's the point that I think probably half of the churches in the United Methodist Church still are at. They did not, they were not a part mm -hmm. of uh, a good information campaign. They they haven't been allowed to do their own research. the The clergy that they've had on site have not told them about what's going on, and so after this next general conference next month there's a good chance that a lot of congregations that were able to avoid the congregation or the conversation are going to have it now uh, or then. And at that point, they're going to have to gird up their loins, theologically speaking, 
uh, which is to say, get ready f- for battle. And for some people, that's going to mean contending for the the soul of your local church and standing against the larger body. For some people, that's going to mean uh, giving up on your local uh, church uh, building and starting afresh with your own people. And that depends on a lot of things that are outside of their control, whether or not the denomination makes a new provision for disaffiliation or uh, if, you know, there are a lot of things up in the air. But what I think I would need if I were in one of these congregations that's that's currently stuck is I would need a pep talk of, I think what what's happening right here is I'm the one trying to say, step up, be bold, don't be afraid of failure. You're saying some of this too, but you're also given this personal testimony of, look at this small congregation here that started off with nothing, and yet God has been so faithful to them and provided for really their every need. And that's not to say that's going to happen 100% of the time. Who knows how where God is going to choose to answer people. But we do have a God who takes care of us and makes provision for us, but we're not going to see that unless we go out on faith right correct and and jeffrey you you have to understand too like i'm an outsider looking in when i look at what's going on with the umc like most of my window to that has been my friendship with matt and then listening to your podcast and kind of getting myself up to speed with what's been going on in the umc what's going on in the gmc Mm -hmm. Uh, but the more the more i hear as an outsider looking in the more it looks like money is being used by those in authority to keep people where they want them instead of allowing them to leave if they feel like they should. And my thing is money shouldn't be what keeps you where you are. Like it shouldn't be about money. God has shown us in scripture and I can give testimony after testimony in my own life where God has provided financially for me when I took a step out in faith. And I think that he will do the same thing for congregations, whether it's individual members or entirely new churches trying to start up. God will provide financially for those needs mm. if people are stepping out in faith and following his will. That's a good testimony. And I, you know, sometimes we go full hour with our interviews, but I think a lot of people are just going to want something to the point. And I think that's what this has been. So uh, I will be interested in, in long term how this church does. So please keep me in the loop and I'll, I'll keep my um, audience apprised as well. But I just sure appreciate, let me say on behalf of your congregation, on behalf of uh, Methodists really appreciate you taking pity on them and requiring nothing but just serving the Lord with gladness in this in this fellowship. There are not many people willing to do that, and I just think it really speaks to your character and uh, your faith. And Dan, thank you so much for for offering yourself the way you have to that fellowship. Well, thank you. It, it's an honor and a privilege. Like I said, like when, I, when my wife and I talked about it, we said these people stood up for truth. They lost their church over it. We want to do whatever we can to help them. Well, and yeah, thanks to your wife and your boys as well, because what this requires is that they lose a chunk of you. Um, that's that's the nature of mm-hmm. being a clergy family. And and ideally, it all works together, and, and they gain from it, and, and God is glorified from it. But there's a lot of additional anxiety added to the family, a lot of—and um, it that can be a blessing, but it can also be a curse. So— your wife and your boys also had to go out on faith with you. And so um, tell them that uh, some nobody on the Internet thank them uh, for, for being a part of this adventure with their father. I just think I think the world of families, clergy like you and families like yours, I, I don't care about the big name people. I care about the salt of the earth, uh, people just serving God humbly. And, and God bless you and your family, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah. All right, friends. Well, that's going to be the end of of this conversation. If you have additional questions and follow-up, you're welcome to write me privately, and I can forward stuff to Dan if you like. You can also just write in the comments, and I'd like to think Dan will check up on the comments and follow up with people as needed. I can as well, but we want to do our part to help other congregations that just need to be bold or have additional questions to ask. Uh, we're, We're eager to help you, and that's not to say leave the United Methodist Church no matter what. United Methodist Church might be a good fit for you and your congregation, and if that's the case, then this this wasn't for you. But if you are feeling like it's it's not a good thing, don't give up hope. There is There are some options, and consider Dan's words, consider my encouragement at this time. And uh, my prayer for you before we cut this thing off is that you can look at this time in your life as a time when you chose to step out on faith and found God was faithful. 
Um, so may this be a blessing to you. And I, I just want to thank those of you who've supported the Plain Spoken channel. If you're at all impacted by this and you appreciate the work that I'm doing, you can go to plainspoken.locals.com. That's where you can become a supporter. And make sure to subscribe because I have other, you know, Dan is an exceptional person, but there are a lot of other exceptional people that I highlight uh, stuff coming up. So stay tuned and uh, I'll see you again soon.